bit, so I'm not going to talk a long time today. I feel like God has placed something on my heart that is just short and right to the point. How many of you guys know that God can change everything in a sentence or the single word, right? So I'm going to try to do it with a couple words, okay? So I'm just going to try to do that. So this morning we're talking about um, the armor of God. We're talking about body armor, and we're talking about suit up part two. And in the coming sermon series that I'm going to do, I'm going to talk specifically about each piece of armor and what it does for you and how it's going to impact you. But today, I just want to continue to talk about suit up because I feel like God put some things on my heart to continue to to press into this idea of suiting up. So I'm only going to take a couple of minutes this morning. So you don't have to get comfy in your seat very long. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Is our, so our weapons are not against flesh, right? It's not against other people. It's, against a, it's a spiritual thing we're talking about here, right? So he's not actually asking you to put on physical armor, right? He's asking you to put on spiritual armor. Therefore, put on the full armor, God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He who dwells he who dwells in God's armor is protected. There is a spiritual thing that happens here when you armor up and you begin to become strong. And just like I talked about during praise and worship is that when we are hardened to the things of this world that have hurt us, that have broke us down, and we've closed ourselves off to harden. See, the armor of God wants to come so that it can be the hardness that we need so that we are allowed to be soft, right? We are flesh and arrows pierce us, but it does not pierce a shield or a breastplate right? So we need to put on armor so that we don't have to be the hard ones. And that's the problem is that so many times we take up our own strength, we take it up in our own way, and we fail at that. And so we need to learn this morning how to to armor up. So last week we talked about how to get authority, right? To how to have the authority to armor up. And we talked about the two things that you need in order to armor up. And that's the authority that comes with Christ, and the power of Christ, the power of God in our lives. We have to have not only the authority but also the power of God, right? Without, without authority, we have no right to it. Without the power, we cannot use it. So this morning, we talked about the authority. So this morning, we're going to go on and talk a little bit about the power of God. So what happens is in Psalms 100 point, point four, 104 says, with thanksgiving, we enter his gates, and with praise, we enter his courts, right? So we have this passport in order to get into his court. And how many of you guys have ever stood in the court of a king? Nobody? Nobody's, no one's ever been invited to the court of a king? Well, spiritually, but physically, we've never been invited to that? Don't you think you might learn a few things about that king if you were in his presence? So let me explain something to you. So the idea is, is that when we enter praise, something changes. And I talked about that, that how something changes with us in our atmosphere. When we get around God, when we, when we praise God, we enter his courts, which allows us access to the armory. It allows us access to this armor. But I want to paint the armor in a little bit different picture, maybe something you haven't seen before. So I have a picture here of some Jewish armor. I don't know why we have vivid on there. I must have messed that up. Uh... I have a picture here of some Jewish armor that's going to go up here. Really? Anytime. There it is. There it is. So this is a Judean high priest, okay? And this was his war armor. And typically, like in Numbers, they talked about the priests going in front of the war, okay? And so they traveled in front of the war. That's pretty nice. That's a pretty nice breast piece he got on there. It has 12 jewels in it that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. It has a crown on it. And I think that when Paul was sitting in that prison, that he may have been merging the two. I don't actually think he was talking completely about just some Roman soldier's armor. I think he was talking about something spiritual, and he was kind of referencing the idea of what it means to be a priestly warrior. What it means that the Bible says that we are all called to be priests, amen? That we are a royal priesthood 
called according to his will. Okay, and so he's talking here about the priest's garments a little bit and about the breastplate that he wears. That's why it's called the breastplate of righteousness. This is a priest. All right, so he fuses the idea of wearing this armor and what each one means. And we'll break down it that way. But I want you to understand that wearing the armor doesn't just make you a fighter. It makes you a praiser. It makes you a prayer warrior. You're supposed to mount up and follow God come hell or high water. Amen? Amen. Kings and priests. Amen. So that's what we're talking about here. So when he's talking about the, the armor of God, it's don't just picture a Roman soldier. Understand that we are royal priesthood. That when you put on the armor, you become a priest. Not just me. I'm not the only pastor in here. That we are all called to the same standard. Just because I'm the one that delivers the word most of the time does not change that we're all called to the same standard. It also doesn't uh, change that we're all susceptible to the same arrows. Right? It doesn't say take up a different shield for each person that has a different shield, right? Well, priests get this shield and regular people get that shield, right? We're not the general. Jesus is the general. We're just soldiers in the army. So we're all susceptible to the same arrows. We're all susceptible to the same attack. We're all susceptible, but we all get the same armor. And just because one is a mechanic and one delivers a message doesn't change what we have to do. So it's very simple. It's not different for each one of us. It's the same thing for each one of us. So it makes it kind of easy to figure out, okay? And so I want to paint this picture. So now we've entered into praise. We've entered into praise and we enter into the, the holy of holies. We enter into the courtyard or the court of God and we're standing there in his presence. How many of you guys understand that it's very easy to figure out the will of God in your life when you're standing there in his presence? It's very easy to understand who he is when you're in the courtyard listening to his instructions, right? It's kind of hard to stand on the outside of the wall and understand what the king wants from you right? So he calls us into his presence and he calls us before his throne so that he can instruct us, so that he can order us, so he can give us dominion over what he has. So I want to paint this picture and see him. Paul is sitting in prison, right? We talked about that last week. He's sitting in prison and praise starts to rise up out of Paul and something changes. He sees something different. And in Ephesians 6, it comes to light. He starts to understand what he's seeing. So I want to paint the picture of what Paul sees as what this armor represents. See, we're born into a place of rebellion. We are rebellious. We are rebels thrown in jail, and the key has been thrown away, and the sign over our head says, destroyed rebellion. So I'm going to introduce you to the gospel this morning. We are rebels, and we are in a prison cell. And because of the rules and the law of this world and of nature, see, Satan has his authority to punish us. He has the right to lock us away in prison. He has the right to do that. It is legal for him because this world has been handed over to him for, for that legal purpose. We are in a prison cell and the enemy has a legal right and there is no escape for us. So when Paul begins to praise, what we learn is that when our praises rise to heaven, see something miraculous happens. The intercessor steps in and Jesus comes into our cell where we're at and he begins to break chains that are unbreakable. We are bound by chains that even a diamond saw can't cut. But Jesus, the intercessor, comes and he breaks our chains. And he sets us free from those chains. And he goes and he changes our sign to destroyed to life. And he makes our sign speak life again. And we are redeemed and we are renewed. And we are no longer shackled to a wall in a prison cell. But yet we sit in a prison cell. And see, Jesus came to die for us and he gave his life. I want you to understand that God died that he died to free you from a prison cell, that he died to free you from shackles, that you were chained to a wall so that you could be free. The God of heaven and earth died to set you free. He took the keys, amen? What do you think he was doing in hell? He was getting the keys to hell, death, and the grave because that's what chained you. And so he set you free from those chains. But I want you to know, while that story is amazing, and while that's important, and while that's the, the, the greatest story ever told, that that's not enough for Jesus. That's not enough for our God. He didn't die just so you could be unshackled and sit in a prison cell. Some of you need to get up and start checking that door and realize that you are not in jail anymore. Amen. And see what happens is you finally, what happens is something comes to life inside of you and you realize that you need the presence of God. So you push open that door and you walk outside and you realize you're free and you see the sunlight on your face for the first time and a chariot rolls up 
and wills and, and an emissary comes out and he hands you a note and says, you are invited to the courtyard of the king because you have praised him in your cell and now he's invited you to the court of the king. And so you get a note from that and it's sealed and you go and you're invited to the king and you fall down at his feet and you begin to worship him. You are the king of kings and you died for me. And now the same God that died for you invites you into his presence. And you stand before him and you kneel before him. And he says, you are well and deserving. Understand you're a rebel. You shouldn't be here. You haven't done anything to earn it. You've done nothing deserving. And he invites you into his presence. So you're at his feet and he says, come to me. So now he, you become his servant and he says, will you serve me? Will you follow me? And you say, yes, I will give my life for you, God. I will stand for you. I will live for you. And he says, I want you to understand something. While I teach you something, I don't want you to remain here in my court. See, I have a commission for you. You're my ambassador and I'm gonna send you back to the same prison cell you just left. Because, see, there are other people locked away in that jail, and I need you to go get them. But you need to understand that there's an enemy that's coming for you. It's not going to be safe. It's not going to be easy. It will be dangerous. He wants to kill you. He wants to rob you. He wants to embarrass you. But don't worry. If you will just pick up that armor I have for you, I will protect you with the king's armor. And I will send you back into a destroyed world that wants to destroy you. And I will send you back to the very prison that you left so that you can bring others to life. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to do. Amen. Amen. He's called us to life. He's called us to serve him. He's called us into his presence. So we mount up with the armor. And see, praise gives us the right to the armor. But the power comes differently. The power comes differently. See, every night I pray with my children. And I pray over them. And I, I pray the same thing a lot of times. You know, I, I, uh, They repeat after me. And, you know, Lord, help us to love like you. Right, how many of you guys pray like that? Lord, help me to have, to love like you, to see like you, to hear like you, to have wisdom like you. And I've had a revelation. And how many of you guys know when you have a revelation from God, you're never the same again? So I've had a revelation. God has hit me with something so powerful, so profound. And I want you to hear me this morning because there is good news. And I want you to understand what's happening is that if you pray that way, I don't want you to ever pray that way again. Don't ever ask Jesus or God to help you love like him. See, here's the difference is that if you want to know how to get the arm, the power to have the armor of God, it's very simple because Jesus looked at that servant and said, I want to explain something to you. I'm not just going to send you out there because what I'm asking you to do, you can't do. The enemy will kill you. You cannot do it. Even with some armor, you can't do it. So here's what it is. I can. So instead of just calling you as my ambassador, I'm going to adopt you and you're going to become my son. You're become the family of God. But you know what? I'm not going to stop there. I'm not just going to adopt you, but I want you to do something for me. I want you to open yourself up and I want to live inside you. Because then you have the power to accomplish what I'm calling you to accomplish. So I'm going to dwell inside of you so that you can go accomplish the things that you want. So we praise God. He lives inside of us and we are empowered to fulfill his will. Power comes when we dwell in the shadow of the, of the Most High, right? Now, Psalms 91, we talked about the ministry there, and the sh Psalms 91 is interesting to me. Verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? And while that's an amazing, amazing scripture, and we want to pray that over it, what's it more exciting is to find out that we are actually in Psalms 91, uh, 91 2.0. That we've moved on. That Jesus came and he said, you know what? I love that you're in the shadow of the Almighty, but I'm going to do one better. I'm going to live inside of you. He who dwells inside of you has empowered you, and you never have to worry again. So get under God's shadow, and then get before him in his presence, and let him live inside of you. And I'm not talking about salvation this morning, okay? I'm not talking about step one. Salvation is the breaking of chains, right? 
It's being released. I'm talking about being so close to God and intimate with God where you're in the presence of God and you allow him to make the decisions for your life. You allow him to move in your life where you just say, you know what? I'm not content with this natural world anymore. You keep talking about spiritual things and spiritual armor and that we don't wage war against the flesh but against spiritual things. Yet I have no clue about any of the spiritual stuff. I don't have a clue how to live that way. I don't have a clue how to be powered up because I just live in this natural world where the guy cuts me off and I honk at him and call him a name, right? Right? Call him blessed. Yeah. I honk him and I call him a name, right? Right? I do that too. But you know what my next thought is? You know what my next thought is? First, it's you idiot, right? Okay, I'm just repenting, right? Just confess your sins one to another, right? David knows. David understands this. I've ridden with David. He's worse than me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hey, we're growing together, right, brother? We're growing together. Iron sharpen iron. Sometimes we're sharpening our idiot. But uh, <laughs> so the next thought in my head is, you know what? I don't know where that guy's going. I don't know if he just got a call and his wife's in the emergency room. And I start to bless him and speak blessing over him and said, God, whatever's going on in his life, if, he, if he's in a hurry to go somewhere because, he, because something tragic has happened to him, I ask that you reach down into his life and show him love. That you reach into his life and show him your peace, Father God, and that you speak that. And I begin to speak blessings over that person. I cursed him a second ago, but now I'm going to bless him because I refuse to be disempowered by the end enemy that would throw darts and arrows at me. I'm going to block every one of those by speaking the way that Jesus told me to in the authority of the Christ. Amen. You begin to do something different. It's my favorite word this last month, perspective. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know why you're cranky. You don't know why I'm cranky. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what battles I faced this week. You don't know what storms came my way. You don't know that 24 hours ago I was wanting to kick something really hard. And it might have been a person. It's probably just a wall. I'm not saying. And I have to remind myself that my war is not against flesh. But it's against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness that want to put me back in chains. And every time we give in to that anger, into that hurt, into the rage, into the bitterness, every time we give in to it, even so much as given in to the, that contempt that we feel in our hearts, that we descend deeper and deeper. Instead of freeing people from prison, we start to put ourselves back in the cell. Amen? Yeah. Our job is to open doors, not enter the cell. Yeah. So we need to break free from that and understand that there is a living God who wants to live inside of us. And the armor there is, is less there for us. If God lives inside of us, what's the armor protecting? If he lives in our heart, what's that bre breastplate of righteousness saying? It's saying I'm protecting the righteous one that lives inside of you. Amen? So he's protecting himself from that. So instead of praying, Lord, let me love like you. Instead of praying, Lord, let me, let me see like you. Lord, let the love of Christ be my love. Let the eyes of Christ be my eyes. Not I don't want to see through your eyes. Let them be mine. Come and indwell in me, God. And let this be a temple for you. That the love that I have is yours exuding from within me. So I will no longer say, Lord, teach me to love like you. Let your love be the light that shines through my eyes to a lost and dying world that I might be your love, that I might be your wisdom, that I might be your eyes, that I might be your feet, that I might be your hands. He has bonded with us in marriage. We have become one flesh. I don't want to be like him. I want to become one with him. Amen. Amen. And some of you guys are trying to do it on your own like David did. David, Saul offered him his own armor and said, do it like me. And David had to say, no, I, I, I got to let God handle this one. I can't do it on my own. And the problem is when you start to pick up your own armor and you start to pick up your own ideas and you start to try to do it yourself. No, no, no. And, and trust me, this is a human thing, right? It only takes a few months for a baby to learn how to talk. And, you know, he's going from, from mama, dada to I do it. 
right? How many of you guys have kids? I do it. I do it. They want to do it themselves, right? While you're going, no, you can't do that. You're going to break it, right? And everything breaks, right? A little child, I do it. And see, we grow up and we think, I do it. We've learned this selfish nature of, I do it. And we haven't realized that we need to let God do it through us. We need to be the hands and feet, but God needs to do it through us because our idea of how to do it is not as good as his. I mean, I don't know how to put it any more simple than that. It's just not as good. Our ideas suck, okay? They're kind of substandard, right? I don't know what kind of genius baby you have, but mine at two years old did not like have it all like together. They weren't like, no, if you just move that over there and move that over there and move that around, it'll stack better, dad. That would be Rachel's children, though, and more than she's a stacking maniac, right? They don't have an idea how to do it better, right? So you have to help them. You have to do it with them. How many of you guys have had to grab your own children's hand to teach them something and guide their hands to do it, right? Right? How many of you guys did the training them to do the fist bump? Anybody ever do that? You got to, like, curl their fist, and then, like, you, you force their hand into a fist bump until they get it themselves, right? It's like training a cat to use the potty. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Stubborn little children. Cat lovers, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stubborn little children, but I want to explain something to you, and we're going to close with this. I told you I'm not going to take very long today. I, I want you to understand that in order to have the power of God, so the authority of God in order to have armor comes when you praise. It comes when you exalt a living God who died to set you free. He sets you free when you praise. The power of God comes when you surrender, when you allow him inside of you to live through you. And as Renee comes to play this morning, we need to get there because it only works through power and authority. Your life will never be the same. And if I talk on spiritual things this morning and it doesn't seem as practical, I want you to understand that it's extremely practical. And I'm telling you that if you keep living your life looking at the natural world and staring at every situation you have, my heater's broke, my truck's broke, and I keep staring at those things, that my focus becomes in the natural, that I forget that my wars are not against flesh. They're not against the natural world. And see, Satan wants to do that. He wants to distract you from your true enemy. Because if your eyes are off the king and your eyes are off the world that you really belong to, then you're susceptible to fall. And then you begin to pick up your own shield and your shield does not stop those arrows. So if you have arrows this morning that are being thrown at you, my encouragement is to seek a God who wants to dwell inside of you. To ask him to permeate every cell in you, every bit of you, to take control and lay your life down at an altar before him and say, you, my king, I will serve. I make this pledge this day that I will serve you, even if it means my life, even if it means my death. He died for you and we won't do the same. We won't give up ourself to live for him. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you that you are mighty. That you are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. That he who dwells in the Almighty. He who dwells in the Almighty. That we become a strong tower. That we become the refuge that we seek. Through your strength, God. Through your empowerment. This morning, maybe some of you have said, I've never even made that first step. I've never accepted Jesus in my heart. I want to be victorious in this world, but I don't know Jesus. I've never accepted him into my heart. If that's you this morning and you want to make that commitment, I just want to pray with you, just me and you. Just raise your hand. No one's looking around. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. It's the most important decision you could ever make is to live for him. If you're ready to live for him this morning for the first time, raise your hand. Amen. If you would say to yourself that I'm tired of doing it my way, I'm tired of having 
defeat when I'm supposed to live in victory. I'm tired of looking at my circumstances instead of the king that I'm knelt down before. And that's you that you've been doing it in your own power. And it's time to let God permeate every part of you. If that's you this morning, let me pray with you. Raise your hand so I can see you. Amen. 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 It's time to armor up, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to be a holy people, a priesthood set apart with victory. And we're not alone. We are not alone. No army goes to war alone. It's not an army if it's just one. We are an army. And it takes all of us wearing the armor of God and surrendering to God that we might stand with each other against a world that wants to conquer and devour us. Everything in this world was set up by science and nature. Everything was set up to devour itself. Everything is rusting away. Everything is breaking down. Unkept everything, your houses, your cars, your life will crumble. Everything will fade away. That's the way this world is designed that from the minute you're born, everything wants to devour you. And it's only through Christ that we have life. And we have it to the fullest, amen? And we stand with each other. Lord God, I ask you bless each and every person here, the ones that raise their hand, Father God, that you would saturate them, Father. An overwhelming, overwhelming and filling of your spirit, God, that it dwells inside them, that the Holy Spirit live and breathe and move through them, that you send them power on high. Lord, you came down at Pentecost and filled your believers, Lord. And I ask that you fill those now that are crying out to you, God. Ask them now, pray with me. In the name of Jesus, we ask that you fill our hearts, God. In the name of Jesus, we ask that you come and saturate us, God. In the name of Jesus, let your Holy Spirit have control of our lives, Lord, of our hearts, of our spirit, that we might have your love, have your eyes, have your will done in our life, God. Oh, Lord, we surrender to you. The Bible says we're two or more. Ask anything. According to his will, it shall be given to them. It's so much easier to know his will when we're standing there listening to him. I want you to go back into that cell, Ren. Lord, I ask that you give me strength to go back in the cell. Granted. I want you to share my words with a lost and dying world. Lord, I ask that you give me the strength and the words to speak when I go to that lost and dying world. Granted. Granted. Lord, I ask that you give me the armor of God that I might stand against the enemy that does not want me to fulfill your will. Granted. See, he's just looking for you to ask what he's already asked you to do. It's so easy this morning. We surrender, Lord. We surrender. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. Lord, you amaze me. Thank you, Lord, that you invite us into your court. That you have made us into a royal priesthood in the court of the Most High King. That we are set apart, blessed by you, God. And some of you guys don't believe that this morning. I feel like there's this sense of, but I'm not blessed. The Lord is telling there's some of you in this room this morning that no matter what I say, you just feel like you're the one that's not blessed. But you say, but not me. God doesn't, God's not blessing me. Maybe your situation, I don't know, but just that doubt and fear that God is not for you. 
So that's for somebody this morning. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. If that's you, you can raise your hand if you want to, but somebody in here doesn't believe they're blessed this morning. You don't believe that you are a royal priesthood, that you are called to be a king of the Most High God, that you are a prince amongst a lost and dying world. You don't believe that Jesus would have came and died just for you if it was only for you. You're holding back your breakthrough. You're holding back the blessing by your lack of belief in how much God loves you. You're withholding what God wants for you because you just simply can't believe he wants it for you. That's for somebody this morning. I need to take, that's for somebody this morning. I pray that those chains be broken off you that are holding you down, whoever that is, and you can find me afterwards, but that's for somebody. You're free this morning. You need to have a revelation of God's love, a revelation of God's love for you and over you, that you are, you are his beloved and he is yours and you need to fall in love with him and realize that he loves you from the foundations of the earth he prepared a path for you Jesus loves you Jesus Christ loves you he loves you Take that out of your head and put it in your heart. Have a revelation that Jesus loves you. Amen. Amen. If you believe that this morning, say amen. Amen. And I love you. I love you guys. I'm a blessed pastor. How many of you guys see my Facebook post and I put hashtag blessed pastor? You ever seen that? I'm a blessed pastor. My struggles are the same as yours, but I'm a blessed pastor. I get to get up here every week and see the most wonderful people and serve with the most wonderful people. And I happen to think that our little battalion is pretty awesome. Is that right? Any of my military guys, did I get that wrong? There's like a hundred of us. Is a company? Like how many is a company? about 120 so almost a company almost a company right and then after that that's like too much for company <laughs> so how do we go to how do we how do we what's the next one from company anybody what's after a company a battalion how many is a battalion anybody know five so are we going to change from a company to a battalion amen how many of you guys think that if you march into battle with a battalion, you might be better off than a company? Amen? That's why this church is growing. Because God's raising up an army for last days that he might see his will done in this world. So we're going to change. We're going to do services. And we're going to find another building so that we can go from a company to a battalion. And from a battalion to a regiment. And then we can start something where an army of God changes the world. Amen? And we go to war with this world and show them the love of God can change their life. Amen? That's why we grow. So every time you invite somebody here, understand you're asking them to join an army. You're asking them to stand beside you and do battle. If you want to go to war alone, don't. Don't bring anyone. That's fine. But I would like you standing beside me when I go through that fight. Amen? And I go through fights. You go through fights? Do you go through battles? Right? We like to call them struggles, but I'm just going to refer to them as battles from now on. I've been battling this week. And I need some warriors to stand with me. Amen? I'll stand with you. You stand with me. Back to back, we'll fight. Amen? Amen. If you believe that, come on. Somebody just give God some praise. We thank you, Lord. You're worthy. Amen. Pastor Larry is going to bless us this morning.